music, literature, drama, the whole culture, particularly the religion of all the people of Asia can be traced directly to the Africans of Asia. India, Japan, China, just to name a few, even Afro-American history can be traced directly to the Africans of Asia. I know it sounds strange to you, but the world owes a debt to the Africans of Asia. In the following presentation, you'll find out exactly why. Just give me a few seconds. Your ancestors never intended to let you down. In this book, called The Gods of Northern Buddhism, we find a name, the Asian name of the supreme deity of the universe. His name is Sambo. They say when nothing else was, Sambo was the name of the god of the universe to the people of Asia. And there are many places that carry this name. This is a depiction of Sambo. This is not an African statue. This is from Asia. And many places in Asia are called Sambo Judasia, the land of the descendants of Sambo. Various spellings of the word and the name Sambo can be found throughout Asia. Negas, the divine people of Buddhism. This is a second century depiction of Gautama the Buddha being given his first bath by the divine people of Buddhism called Negas. A tribe in Asia called Negas, the divine people of all the people of Asia, symbolized throughout Asia by the serpent or the dragon. That is their symbol. The Nega means serpent or dragon, the snake found at the entrance of every temple, the Nega on the roads, on the hills, in the caves, the symbol of the Asiatic black man, the tribe called the Negas, the divine people. There are cities also throughout Asia that carries this particular name, Nega. It can be seen at all ceremonies dealing with worship of God. From the Nile Valley to the Indus Valley, on tombstones, a symbol of immortality because of the serpent's ability to change his skin is a sign of never dying and is used throughout the planet Earth, North, South America, Egypt, Asia, Africa, throughout the world. It's the symbol of life after death, the nega, the serpent. In all ancient cultures, in all ancient religions, the serpent is the symbol the Nega, the symbol of divinity of God. The original inhabitants of Southeast Asia was called the Mons, an African tribe. In order to confirm what these people look like, you have to go to the archaeological finds from Davarati, a French uh, archaeological research finding confirming the original inhabitants. There's no depictions uh, preceding these of the original inhabitants of Southeast Asia. The people, the descendants of Sambo, the Asiatic black man. The seven serpents or seven rays or the negas surrounding his head represent the cosmic forces that afford him protection. He is a divine representation of cosmic forces and those seven serpents represent his divine mission. He does not come of his own. He's a manifestation of the cosmos. The serpents or the nega represent cosmic forces which is at his command, which represent him as a divinity. He is the manifestation of the universe. That is the symbol of those serpents you see surrounding his head. In essence, the seven serpents are cosmological, dealing with astrology, it's astrological representations of those forces of the cosmos that he represents. He is a universal monarch, a universal king, which he manifests and he shows evidence of. The black man of Asia, the original inhabitants of Asia. He is a human being of flesh and blood. He comes as a teacher, as a manifestation of God. His teachings are called the Dharma. He is called the Buddha, the intelligent one, the one who has achieved intelligence, or the genie, the conqueror. He comes 
to explain the laws of the universe. He comes to confirm that there is, in fact, life after death. When the Buddha appears, he appears as a preacher, and he preaches the Dharma. That existence is a continual cycle of death and rebirth, and that each person's position and well-being in life is determined by his or her behavior in their previous lives. For example, good deeds may lead to rebirth as a wise and wealthy person or as a being in heaven, and a person's evil deed could lead to rebirth as a poor and sickly person, or even rebirth in hell. He preaches that you reap what you sow. A Buddha also teaches that it's possible to break out of this cycle and gain the kind of perfect peace and happiness by practicing righteousness. They are manifestations of God. According to their prophecies, they promise to prove and make manifest through a Buddha or a Jina life after death before the end of this century. How can you teach a people to know God if he himself does not know God? If you try teaching a Christian that God is also a human being or manifests himself in the form of a human being or makes himself known through a human being, they will say that you're crazy, that you don't believe in God. Meanwhile, they admit that he's a mystery God who is unknown. They teach not to make any likenesses of him, yet they adorn their walls and churches with pictures, images, statues like human beings. They also say he's a spirit that cannot be seen. They cannot see him, yet they believe in him. In order to remove all doubt, the Buddha, the enlightened one, the intelligent one, the genie, the conqueror, decided to make manifest to the world irrefutable evidence. They wanted to prove to a people in the future the manifestation of God, that God manifests himself through human beings, through men. Now, prophecy is irrefutable. A prophecy is a written confirmation of what will happen at a future date. These people, the black people of Asia, predicted or prophesized what they would do 2,500 years into the future. The prophecy states that he would send something from the past and join it with something from the future. Something from the material world and join it with something from the spiritual world. The union of both the past and the future worlds and the spiritual and the material worlds would be contained in the revelation of a secret mystic diagram called the Mandela of Two Parts. This is a depiction of the future Buddha who would make this manifest at a point before the end of this century. Now the scriptures of the world have all prophesied at the end of the age which we are now entering, the age of Aquarius, we shall see the revelation of that which is secret and the emergence into the light of day of that which has hitherto been concealed and veiled. This, our present age, is that time, the end of the cycle, the beginning of the new age. This book by Ivan Van Sertema raises the question of the African presence in early Asia. How did they get to Asia? This is the future Buddha. How did they get to Asia? They were called the Mons. And the wind and the rain in Asia is called the monsoon. This is the key to how they got to Asia. The monsoon wind in April blows from the southwest. And in October, it blows from the northeast. The monsoon wind blows from Africa to Asia and from Asia back to Africa. The wind from April to October blows from the southwest and from October to April, it blows from the northeast. These two trade routes and routes that of travel is the direction of the Mons, the Africans of Asia. They went from Africa to Asia and from Asia to Africa 
and they were called the Mons, like the monsoon. Africa was called Hither India, which India, here I am, come hither, come here, where I am. And they would get on the ocean and get in the wind. This is where the phrase, get in the wind, come from, from your previous life. The Africans of Asia got to Asia by getting in the wind. This is confirmed from the first century the Greeks knew how they got to Asia, the wafting sailors. They call it the divine ship of salvation, the Mons, when they would arrive in Asia and when they would leave Asia. The Japanese badge of, uh, of nobility is called a Mon. The monsoon, the monastery, Mani, is identified with the black man of Asia. And the largest statues on the planet Earth located in Asia are depictions of the Buddha, the black man, the Jina. His hair confirms who he is. This is the largest statue in China and the largest statue on Earth depicting the black man. The oldest and largest manifestations of God, like this image of the Buddha in Thailand and Southeast Asia, are representations of the black Africans of Asia. There are no other statues or monuments of antiquity that precede them. They manifest themselves on earth and prove life after death. This from Ceylon or Sri Lanka showing the Buddha, thousands of years old. They are the largest statues on earth represent, representing the black people of Asia or the black man of Asia, the one who comes back from the dead to prove immortality. They do it all the time in all the countries and they prophesied that they would do it before the end of this century. This is the largest statue in Sri Lanka the largest statue in China, the largest statue in India, the largest monolithic statue on earth, the genie, the one who comes back from the dead, carved in solid rock 70 feet high. The largest monolithic statue on earth is the black man and it is not in Africa, but it is in Asia. The Asiatic black man, the manifestation of God who comes back to preach and explain the doctrine of immortality how to escape the fires of hell. That is his sole purpose. To attack him is to attack the cosmic forces of God. He sits in Western style because he will be born in the West. The people who he, who he will be born among are called the Negas. This is the future Buddha, the one who is to come, who is to prove with irrefutable evidence for those with intelligence that there is no death, that life is eternal and this evidence of eternal life is put in place by their control after death of the cosmic forces this is a cave in India showing the one who is to come in the future all of these statues and monuments are thousands and thousands of years old the future Buddha sitting down in Western style he is known by many names in many religions to the Christian, he's the Christ. To the Muslims, the Mahdi, the Messiah, the Avatar, Maruku, Maruk Bull. To the Koreans, the Buddha, the Genie. All different names for the same individual who is to appear now at the end of the age, the beginning of the new cycle. He is also called Maitreya, the future Buddha. In this book, Maitreya, the future Buddha, you can find the prophecy of his return in 2,500 years. This prophecy identifies the time when he is to appear. It states that he will appear in 2,500 years in a tripartite year in the first year of a cycle. He will descend to be reborn and he will produce a city of silver by transformation. He will change a city which will serve as evidence of who he is. He must produce a city by transformation. The Buddha was born in 560 BC and died in 480 BC. He received enlightenment at the age of 35, which is 525 BC.
This prophecy had to have been made between 525 B.C. and 480 B.C. If you project 2,500 years into the future, it will come between 1975 and the year 2020. 30, 60, and 90 are tripartite years. 1930, 1960 is gone. The only tripartite year left is 1990. The first year of a cycle is 1991. In 1991, the future Buddha is to appear. 1991. In Angkor, in Southeast Asia, we find the city of the future Buddha. Hidden from the outside world for thousands of years and discovered by the French in 1858. It was hidden in the jungle by fig trees. This is the city designated to confirm the future Buddha. This city was hidden because of the banyan tree, a tree that starts in the sky. Birds drop their seeds from the sky on the leaves of existing trees. The branches spread out horizontally and then grows down, covering everything beneath it. The tree is worshipped throughout Asia. It's called the tree of God. It is the only tree that starts in the sky and comes down. Here you see it written that one tree covered 20,000 people. It is the most unusual tree on earth. It's the fig tree, the banyan tree, the, the, the tree that hid a 36 mile wide city in the jungle for thousands of years. This is the tree of God. Here it is explained that the tree uh, spreads indefinitely and it is not known to die. It's the tree of immortality. It is the most famous tree in Asia, the banyan tree, the tree of God. This is the artist's depiction of the city of the future Buddha, a city of stone, a stone Bible of the religious teachings of the Africans of Asia. This is the entrance to the temple called Angkor Thom, a eight mile perimeter covers the city. This picture shows you how the tree starts in the sky and the roots come down covering that face which you see. Those are roots from the tree which started in the sky covering the face of on a tower. There are 50 towers in this city with faces of the future Buddha. This is a close up on the future Buddha's face with the roots which started in the sky and came down to cover it. The fig tree. This is a, a picture of that particular city, a map showing you the 36 mile, mile, mile uh, perimeter. And there's a seven mile perimeter around this city of Ankatan. This is the city which we will focus on, the Bayon, the central temple of Ankatan. This city is viewed as a Bible, a sermon in stone. As you can see, it was built by men to confirm and serve as evidence, irrefutable evidence, of the future Buddha. That the Africans of Asia who built this here, they knew and wrote the future before it happened. And that the future Buddha would use these stone images of himself, these 50 stone face towers, skyscrapers in the sky, stone monuments, a Bible on the walls to confirm his identity, hidden in the jungle for thousands of years. Even though the city was sacked of its riches when it was discovered by the French, it still bears testimony to the teachings of the black people, the Africans of Asia. These stone face monuments are depictions of the one to come. There are 50 towers telling you that this one, the future Buddha, who you see here, would be in a tower. The 50 towers representing the 50 states of the United States before they were ever discovered. The lions on the outside also bear testimony since there are no lions in Asia. The lions came from Africa. These are African lions. This map shows you all the animals of Asia. The lion is not an indigenous animal, the tiger is. The symbol China, one of the major symbols. It's the symbol of the Asia society for all the people of Asia, the lion, testimony to the influence of the Africans of Asia. This book on sculpture from Thailand and Cambodia shows you some of the bronze and stone sculpture stolen and put in private collections from this city of the future Buddha. 
These were inside the temples and taken out by the colonial powers and put in private collections for private exhibits, the Africans of Asia. Let me clarify the way of the gods in all cultures. Number one, they write the future before it happens in stone. Then they let the future happen. Then they send one back from the dead who explains it and reveals that which they wrote. This constitutes the execution of judgment. Now, this shows you that there are in fact 50 states in the United States and there were 50 towers in this city. The future Buddha is to appear in a tower in the United States on the seventh terrace. There are seven levels above his head. That's the esoteric teaching. On the walls of this is the story of the people whom this individual, the future Buddha, would appear among. Here we show the Europeans coming in to Africa. We see they have weapons on their shoulders. This is on the walls in this city. We see the African with his bow and arrow going to meet the European on the field of battle. We see the African with his elephants and his weapons of war going to meet the aggressor coming into his country. Here we see the two armies clashing on one single panel on the southern wall at the temple of the Bayonne in this city. The African army on the left, the European army on the right, and they clash in the center of this stone carving of the European invasion of Africa as the Europeans load the African arms to the bottom of the ship and take off to America, onward to America. The middle passage where the Africans are thrown overboard, the entire history or book of revelation or unveiling is shown in this city of the kidnapping of Africans from Africa. This city is a book of revelation, an apocalypse in stone. It is discovered by the one they call Maruk, Maruk Bull, the future Buddha. He discovers and unveils the true meaning of this city. This is in the religious teachings of the people of Asia. He uses a city carved in stone, the true book of revelation, the apocalypse, the book of revelation, which will be discovered and explained. And we will now take you to the true history of the United States of America and their slaves to identify the truth carved in stone thousands of years before it happens about these people, the Africans of America. This document, this is the true document of the slave trade from Great Britain or the British House of Commons. It consists of certified eyewitness reports of the satanic atrocities of slavery. The fact that it was a conspiracy is evident by the pattern of punishment and the systematic step-by-step -step method in which it was applied for over 400 years. It is an orgy in the infliction of pain, the infliction of pain on innocent people with eyewitness step-by-step -step reports on what they was supposed to do and what they intended to do to these people who they identified in their document as an injured humanity. They meant to injure these people and this was their intent. They referred to them as injured humanity. Christians did this to the children of Africa. The science that was used on these innocent people were based on universal cosmic laws. As you see here, there are laws that are above all man-made laws. They're the laws of the gods. They're the laws of the universe, and they govern all humanity. The two laws which we will focus on right now is called the law of karma, the law of cause and effect, and the law of polarity, the relationships between opposites. Both of these laws pervade all things in the universe, and this was the focus of the slave trade. We all know about crack. If a woman takes crack, we now know that that same addiction will be born into her babies. Crack addiction 
in the mother is born into the child. This natural law, the law of rebirth, the law of karma, the law of cause and effect was used on the slave in a corrupted method, in a corrupted manner. The primary objective was to induce the fear of God into the slave. Fear is associated with God. If you fear someone, that person in your subconscious is viewed as God. And fear is something that you always have the expectation of once it's induced in you. So the, the primary objective to get the re desired results would be the creation of a race of people that would worship the European race subconsciously as God. That's the objective. Pain and fear, the infliction of which would cause the slave subconsciously to worship the European as God. And this was the tools that they would use, the tools of instruction, their, their, their kit for a step-by-step -step infliction of pain on the innocent slave so that the slave's children would eventually worship the European as God in their subconscious but never consciously know what they were doing. This is one of the greatest or the greatest crime ever committed by human beings, so-called human being against human beings. The infliction of fear and terror in babies for hundreds of years and images, false images of God put before the babies to worship so a race of people can be falsely worshipped as God. The slave masters used science. They knew that if they could put fear in the minds of the slave, that slave, children of those slaves would be reborn with that fear in them. And that fear would affect what they see and what they hear. This was science used on the slave. If they put those images and affected the mind, it would affect what they see, what they hear, and exactly what they do. It was a science of the mind that was used on the slave. Images, the Bible, and the illiterate. Images are the Bible of those without education. You read the Bible, but the images are collected in your mind, and the images stay in your mind, but what you read may go away. This is carved on the walls in this city thousands of years ago by the black man of Asia to tell the story of the apocalypse. A book that would be revealed by this individual whose name you will find out in a short while. He is the future Buddha, the one who unveils the book of Revelation in a stone city, bringing the past and the future together. Now that we understand the science used to get the desired results of the false worship of the European as God by a group of slaves and their descendants forever and ever if possible, now, let's continue with the story. Once again, on the stone walls, we see the African and the Europeans in combat, fighting to prevent their people from going into slavery. To confirm this is an African people, on the right, you see the djembe, a very popular African drum. And on the left, you see the African talking drum. Not the European, not the Asian, but the African talking drum carved on the walls to show that this was an African people who were carried off as captives. Here it is on one panel with three levels. The war that took place in Africa thousands of years before it happened, carved in stone, bearing mute testimony to what really happened here. Here is how the European artists of that time interpreted that event with his pen. The same event in the British Commonwealth testifying to what they said that they did at that time to the black man. Here, the testimony from a, from a rock in this hidden city tells exactly what happened which was known by the gods. Testimony in silence from a stone, from a paper, in the British House of Commons. I just interpret what they said that they did with their pen to the mothership. $1,200 for Negroes. Negroes for sale, according to these documents, the 
authentic official documents. There are no lies here. The paper speaks loud and clear. Valuable slaves for sale. Mulatris, mulatto. Sarah, Dennis, Fanny, mulatto. Mulatto. Blacks, mulatto, real. What kind of man is this that sells his own babies and anybody else's babies? Good God Almighty. Here we see he not only sold your baby and my baby, but he sold the flesh of his flesh and the bone of his bone. Imagine the unbridled license as they inflicted on the black ones. The great divide of the black family, the separation, according to what they say that they did. Separating the black woman from her baby. Here she is in the history books of America, giving away her baby to a people who she knew would commit every type of the worst crimes of passion with malice that the human mind could think of with unbridled license. According to their own words, this is the history of the black woman and her babies in the United States of America. By their pen, by their own admission, and by the stones of the Africans of Asia, the black woman giving her baby away to a known beast who had already inflicted the same pain on her. In stone, speaking loud on paper, they both sing together the same song. The exploitation and degradation and crucifixion of the black people of America with unbridled license. A stone city in Asia buried in the jungle. The history of the black people. That black woman was forced to go back to the plantation and give her love to the white woman, the slave master's baby. After she gave her baby away, they made her love his. Incredible. This is according to what they say they did. The passions, the worst passions of the human mind, rage with unbridled license. They call us the extraordinary punishment, the infliction of which included malice and fury. According to their words, the voice of their paper, some crimes they would not divulge. That was worse than that. Naturally, the slave attempted to run away, escape from slavery in the Underground Railroad. Yes, say the pen and the stone, yea, shall bear witness against them. The slave and stone running away and the worst thing, getting caught and brought back. Angkor Wat in Southeast Asia, coming back to face the infliction of pain. See, here's some freed slaves with the pen screaming loud, the woman and her baby being caught taken back into slavery, observe the fear in the child. This is their pen speaking to you. This is the power of their pen. In stone, the slaves being caught, who ran away, brought back and thrown down to a lower hell for lower punishment, being beaten, their tongues being pulled out, hung from trees, savagely beaten with bats, sticks, knives they had 50 pound bricks according to what they wrote that they would crush them with they would throw them in hot uh, sugarcane oil they would pour hot lead on them this is what they say they did in this document and here it is screaming from a stone bearing mute witness to what they say that they did confirming that here it is right here, on paper. You see, they would put 50 pound, 70 pound weights around their necks and crush them. Why? They tried to avoid pain. Here they are with the weights and the two Africans under the weights, the Afro-Americans being crushed. And they would let them stay there in pain. What manner of people is this? What kind of people is this? Here's a woman who knew she had to go back to slavery. She said, no, sir. She jumped out the window, confirming 
the effect of the slave master in inducing fear. Here's the meaning of fear in the dictionary. Let the wife see that she may fear the husband. Let her see the pain inflicted on her husband. He maketh the pen speak. The pen bears witness against him. Notice the entire family, the entire plantation looking on. The woman, the husband, as they beat the slaves. The babies, the wife, the family. This was the objective to inflict fear in the entire race. To put the fear of God in the entire race. They never did it without witnesses. Your woman beaten in the presence of her family. A whisper from the pen of the European slave master. He did it. He wrote it and he painted it. The runaway slave took all the pain. One of the primary objectives is to force the black woman to know that her new man was the white man, so he branded her. He made her loyal to him. He raped her. He made her carry his baby, then he invited other nations. He said he was a beast with two horns, North America and South America. The same crimes against the same people. Here we see how they divided the thoughts and beliefs of black people. On the left, we have, to say, for example, the Martin Luther King crew. On the right, the Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad crew. And they both are in conflict with each other. This sculpture is called Hirihara, or divided loyalty. But don't forget the runaway slave. His back bears witness to what he experienced during the entire slavery cycle. Pain inflicted on the black man. Who can argue with that? Who can deny that? And here it is, on paper, they identify and give you a definition of crucifixion, to torture with severe pain and anguish. That's the meaning of crucifixion. And they show the black man. And it's in the tradition of the people of Asia. This is the symbolic representation of crucifixion, of infliction of pain in every part of the body in Asia, in the traditions. The castration of the black man, the cutting off of his penis, the ultimate symbol of crucifixion in stone. A voice from the stone of Southeast Asia showed the black man in the uh, position of the cross with his penis castrated with the man below him with a knife with pins throughout his body showing the severe pain. Him and the black woman were forced to suffer. They are the Christ in Asia. And this is how they did the Christ, in stone and in paper. Before slavery, they never put him on the cross. The pen and the brick and the rock in harmony. The crucifixion of the Christ. This is the true identity of Christ. Black people know very little about this or nothing at all. It's them that they should be worshiping themselves. And here it is. The pregnant women, they were singled out. The Mayflower Madam pimped them, made them sell and prostitute their body on ships and then beat them half to death when they didn't bring back enough money. The Mayflower Madam, the white female. This is where the Mayflower Madam came from. They would grab that black baby and chase that family through the streets, beating the baby was the target. They inflict fear in the mother, made that fear reborn in the baby while they both watched the father hung according to their art from their hands their pen speaking loud and clear attacking foster homes with little black orphanage babies and beating them to death kicking them robbing them raping them beating them hanging them to the old babies they did this according to their pen according to their hands and what they say their art their artists this is a true depiction of what they say they did who are you to argue with this? Who the hell are you arguing with? The science that the European knew was that if he inflicted fear in your babies, that fear would be reborn in their babies. So he inflicted fear in the woman and the children by hanging the father in their presence. So that fear, according to the law of rebirth, according to the law of karma, would be reborn in their babies. So they attacked homes with orphanages with little girls and stoned and 
beat them and rape them and kill them in front of each other so the word of fear could spread the fear of God. False God, the white man, that's the law. The law, the law. No one can evade the law of cause and effect. Evil deed, evil consequence. A crack is taken by a woman, that crack baby will be born and have the same addiction. It's the law of rebirth. It's the law of cause and effect. The baby is reborn with fear. If fear is inflicted with the mother, it just has to be rekindled by an event in the life of that child. Look at these freed slaves and look at the fear in their eyes, even though there's no one there to harm them. It's reborn in their faces. The fear is reborn in the woman and in her babies by law. The law of karma, the law of cause and effect, and these were the tools used to do it. If a slave wanted to eat, they would put this mask on his head to keep him from eating. They would starve him. And those hooks around his neck would catch in the trees if he tried to run away. So if you wanted to eat, they would starve you. The tool on your right is to force feed you. So if you wanted to starve yourself to death, they would feed you. So if you wanted to live, they would make you die. And if you wanted to die, they would make you live. Think about what kind of people you were dealing with. Especially consider the fact that you committed no crime. No crime. Except that you wanted, it was a people who they wanted you to worship them. So this is what they did. The woman and the man. The European woman and the European man would kidnap slaves and sell them back. Colored people. Kidnapping slave catchers for money. Snatch your baby from under your bed and sell him. That's why they call it the crucifixion in stone. Speaking loud when you understand the handwriting of the gods. This is what they did. It's the only way to show it. They shot your husbands when they was in the water swimming according to their art and their pen speaking to you. They sh- beat the old man, 89 years old, 80 and 90 years old, who could not defend himself. They beat him to the ground in front of his kids. They shot the the son in front of his family. This is their pen. This book tells you much of that, a hundred years of lynching, telling you more than 5,000 newspaper articles on black people who was lynched. A colored woman hanged in Oklahoma. This is just telling you some of the stories Negro youth mutilated for kissing white girl. They chopped off his penis and kept it for a silver nag. That's what they did. Negroes take him to jail and riddled with bullets. The black man, the black woman, the black child, nobody was safe. 24 hours a day. Silver nags. See, for the Negro's anatomy, they cut off his penis, his hands, his legs, and sold them as prizes, trophies. Is lynched by orderly mobs suspecting of killing a cow who they favored over the human being. A mule thief is hung who they favored over the black man. They would kill you for stealing chickens and hang you in South Carolina. This is just the last hundred years. Imagine what took place 300 years earlier. They say 70% of the hangings, there was no, no crime even suspected. They would just grab you off the street and do this. Live and in living color. This is the people, this is your history that you tried to avoid in Baruba Dog. They show it like this. They show you being put to the fire. Did you know that? The white man used to burn you at the stake. And the tradition is in Asia where you see the Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire as the ultimate form of pain, the ultimate form of sacrifice which the black people of America had to endure. This is a tradition to remind you when that day comes, what they did to you. Standing around taking pictures and laughing. This was a joyous occasion, mind you. This was no sad occasion. They took souvenir pictures. There it is in Asia on the right and in America on the left. The traditions of the Africans of Asia and the inflict of pain, smiling, proud. What he did. It's always a crowd when you burn a black man. They all want to see and cheer as he burns. This is according to their hand. They had to push back the crowd at the burning of this innocent black man of anything worth being set on fire for. But this is the tradition of the American way. See, they would hang you 
burn you and shoot you at the same time from their hands bearing witness against them. See, they would shoot you running, they would shoot you on the ground and beat you, and they would stomp you at the same time. <laughs> they would work your babies and your mama in the cotton fields for nothing. See, this is how they showed it in stone. The whole family on the plantation in this city in Southeast Asia. They would show the man taking the place of a mule, pulling a plow while his wife guides it. The man is pulling the plow, you see, and they would show you in stone the work that the entire family of the diaspora was forced to endure in this beast with two horns, North America and South America primarily, the United States of America, where this history is carved in this history of the country. It's inseparable. No free labor for 400 years in stone. The rock, the Nestorian stone, the rock shall speak. Yea, he shall make the rock speak. While you worked, you were beaten. While you played, 